My name is Denise, and I'm 34 years old. A few years ago, I met a wonderful man in his early 40s named Cole. In fact, I met him because I applied to a job at his law firm, where he was one of the associate lawyers. I got the job and started working as his secretary. I know pleasure and business should never be mixed, but sometimes the heart wants what it wants. And Cole and I quickly realized that we had a natural chemistry which simply couldn't be ignored. He asked me out, and I accepted, and long story short, we became a couple. It was still working as his secretary, though. I was no less professional due to the fact that I was dating my boss. And the thing is, Cole was no less demanding either. Nevertheless, we got along so well that this duality was never a problem to us. We were perfectly capable of separating the waters. Months passed, and Cole asked if I wanted to live with him. I was thrilled with the idea, but there was a big problem, if I'm allowed to call it that. I live with my mother, and she was confined to a wheelchair. She was in a car accident when I was in my early 20s, and she lost her ability to walk. And besides that, her brain suffered from minor injuries too. This meant that her intellectual capacities regressed. My mother was still functional, but to give an example, it was like she had become a child from a mental point of view. I introduced Cole to my mother, of course, inviting him to our house. At first, she was friendly towards him, but as his visits increased, so did my mother's hostility towards my boyfriend. Bad man, I don't like you. Bad man wants to take daughter away from me. Go away. My mother spoke things like that. I, I didn't know what to do. Fortunately, Cole was very understanding. Listen, there's no need to rush. We can wait before moving in together. Things are good between us as they are, he said. Yes, you're right, but in the future, we have to think of something, I replied, expressing my concerns. I know, but tomorrow is tomorrow, and today is today. We could hire someone to take care of your mother. You know I have enough money for that. There are very skilled professionals, even from a psychological, emotional, and human point of view. They're experienced in dealing with all sorts of personalities. Old people and sick people can be quite complicated regarding their behaviors. They get depressed, they feel abandoned, and of course, they're afraid of dying, Cole said. Yes, it's, it's probably a good idea. My mother's not that old, she's 60, and I wanted to live my life and be happy, but I know this sounds selfish, but I don't want to be her nurse forever, and it wouldn't be healthy for either of us secretly wishing for her death, I said, being sincere. Absolutely. I agree with you, Denise. At first, she's going to reject another person in her daily life, but with time, she'll get used to it. Although, I believe it's best to wait another year before taking that step. Hmm... How about ten months? I asked, with a naughty smile on my face. <laughs> ten months it is, Cole answered before he kissed me. And so it was decided. Cole still visited me now and then, and sometimes he would stay for the night. But this became impossible, because my mother had begun screaming from her bedroom during the night. I want that bad man out of my house! I know he's in there with you, Denise. You don't love me anymore. I'm your mother. You're a bad daughter. You're betraying me. My patience was now completely terminated. I decided to move in with Cole even before the 10 month period. My mother would never accept anything else out of goodwill that would change her, our depressive routine. And so, just like we had planned, Cole was kind enough to hire two women, former nurses, to take care of my mother. 
They would adjust the schedules between them so that my mother would never be alone in the house. And of course, the nurses would be allowed to have their weekly days off as well. When both of them were unavailable due to exceptional reasons like vacations or certain holidays, then Cole and I would stay with my mother, or at least I would. Truth is, I didn't want to abandon my mother. I still loved her, regardless of how hard that was, but I tried to understand her situation. In the beginning, as we predicted, my mother was very hostile towards me with the new arrangement, but I kept visiting her almost every week, and in time, she got used to the nurses. She seemed to be happy, which made me happy as well. I could enjoy my life with my wonderful Cole without feeling regretful. Eventually, I also expected that there came a situation in which neither of the nurses was able to stay with my mother. It was now my turn. Uh, I, I better stay home. Your mother won't be happy to see me, Cole said, and I agreed. I was going to stay with my mother for just a couple days. After sleeping there the first night, I called Cole in the morning, but he wasn't answering his cell phone. Throughout the entire day, this happened. I became worried and went to Cole's house, regardless of my mother's protests. Cole wasn't there. His cell phone was now dead. With a painful, terrified heart, I went to the police and requested them to help me find him. One week passed. My boyfriend was still completely absent. He was now officially a missing person. I moved back with my mother. I didn't have the right to stay at Cole's place, and I also didn't have the money to pay for the nurses, so I had to let them go. My dear Denise, you love me again. I'm so glad you're home, my mother said. But I was miserable. Nevertheless, I was soon to receive news from Cole. After a couple months, the police came to my house. Good morning, officers. Do you have any information about Cole? I asked immediately. Ma'am, yes we do. And unfortunately, it isn't the best. In fact... We are here to arrest your mother. She's suspected of arranging the murder of Cole Truman, the police officer said. My jaw dropped and my blood went cold. What? Evidence seems to be pointing that way, but she's not alone. We have caught one of the nurses as well. We are still on the lookout for the others. The officer barged in to arrest my mother. I was so shocked. I didn't know what to do or say. In time, I got to know what happened. My mother, apparently, had a lot of money, which I didn't know about. It was from my dead father's term insurance. But the truly disturbing thing was that my mother faked her mental disability for years in order to keep me under her wing. She used the money to convince the nurses to kill Cole and get rid of the body. Fortunately, they weren't professional enough and couldn't cover up the murder and unintentionally left traces behind. I am now officially free of my mother and I will never visit her in jail. Unfortunately, I also lost Cole, the love of my life. My life was in pieces. Tell me, where do I go from here? Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> Dame Maggie's smile was infectious. I caught a grin from watching her stand in front of the mirror, twirling this way and that as she assessed her new frame. The glee caught me by surprise, and I sensed my heart snap against the muscly confines of my chest. I was doing the right thing, I thought to myself, as I watched a corrupt concern creep up the side of her face and finally settled. Her mood changed so easily. The bells have worked so much magic on me, Christian, she said. Her new spindling frame was an intoxicating sight that came and went fleetingly. I could sense her yearning for her old body. 
I swallowed awkwardly and wiped the back of my hands over my face to cleanse the sweat that had begun to bead around my brow. She turned back to the mirror and my mind returned to my concern. It had only been a few days and it had worked like magic. I was too excited. I felt my fingers quiver from watching her. Look at me, Christian. I've lost a hundred pounds in 13 days. I'm as lean as those models that walk on a fashion runway. I bet I wouldn't be recognized by anybody right now. She continued to speak as I sensed her tone fall lower, more ruthful. They would love you better, I muttered. Hmm? She heaved and looked back at the mirror. I watched her from where I sat and simple thoughts flooded my mind. The concentration was averted to why I had done what I was doing. Dame Maggie was richer than anyone around. Hers was the type of wealth that was only heard of and almost none had seen. It was a life of possibilities and grandeur, which she had access above anyone else, and I had more access than anyone else in her life. It was for a good reason, but she had always maintained. That's why I call her Dame Maggie. It had been difficult at first, and I had spiraled off her course, but my purpose in the past had catapulted from a whoring young man to wealthy woman who could give me what I desired to something loftier. I was always bound to an insecure fat woman, and now I was possibly the heir of wealth so great it made my head spin to think that she almost never showed me the entirety of it. Standing before me in the mirror still was not Fat Dame Maggie, whose fortune spread across the continents. It was indeed a woman so thin and altered. You know, Christian, I feel so dizzy sometimes when I take those pills. Super helpful, but I must say, she called, distracting me from my line of thought. I saw the worry on her face, etched as a noticeable scowl. Perhaps she did too, because she immediately placed her hands under her eyes and toyed with the rolls of fat under her eyes. I brimmed with impatience. I couldn't wait for the weight loss pills to do its job. The desire scoured through my very fiber of being, like ravaging electricity. I could not afford to lose now, I thought to myself, as I stood from her bed and then got onto my feet. I contracted my muscles and released it playfully, and her eyes lit up from worry to concern. She was always like that. I had learned to deal with it. She waited my approach, frail as she was. I saw the effect of the weight loss pills on her skinny frame, and why she had begun to worry. I had a terrible dream, Christian. I think I should stop taking the pills, she muttered suddenly, seizing me by surprise. I stopped in my tracks briefly and stole a furtive look at her hands which came up by her side. She also glanced at it and they were drying up. It would all go to waste. All my effort and time. I couldn't afford it. It's only been a few days, I urged her. Her eyes went to the counter by the mirror and my eyes followed and there it was. Another glass of water and the pill. She had always wanted to be thin. She had her desires, but she had always been fat. And when she asked for my help, it was my opportunity. Time had not proven itself as an ally until that moment. Now, her hesitation threatened to snatch it from me. I exhaled deeply and stared into her eyes. I reached my hands over and she craned her neck to the rest of the side of her face on my open palm. I stroked the other side of her face, pulling lightly on her hair and caressing her emaciated cheeks as her eyes fluttered. You know, ever since I had you, I've always feared that you would be like me, she murmured with her eyes still shut. I watched her quietly, even though I had heard this story over a hundred times. She was always the fat girl from the day she was born, and it had always affected her self-esteem so greatly that not even wealth and power could have been enough from betraying her vulnerability. I was nothing like her. In fact, I had gone after the same things that had intimidated her in life when she was younger, and I had lived my life as recklessly as I could. 
I had gone after her friends and betted them for money. They had all told me the same thing. Dame Maggie was a strange woman, and I already knew that. You should take your pill for the evening, and I suppose you should stop, I said to her, and her eyes slowly came open. She nodded her head feebly, and I moved my hand from supporting her head. I went straight for the glass and pill. I stood before it, sensing she waited behind me, and I decided that it was best not to wait it out. I slipped the lethal portion from my pants and replaced the slower killer. I handed the pill and the water to her. She took it with a smile on her face and swallowed. My mind raced ahead of time, and I imagined her gasping to death on the floor as I ran to the door to fetch someone who could help. An autopsy would be useless, as a cardiac arrest would be the most they would suspect. She had become lean too quickly, they would say, and I would be rich. You know, I had always thought you'd never do it, she said, still grinning as she stared at me and handed me the glass. What? I quizzed in confusion. I am your mother, Christian. I know you. This was all my design. I could not die with the guilt that I left you to this sick world to yourself, so I had you do it. Anyway, I drunk the pill. I'm sick of this world already, she sighed. What are you talking about? I asked, sweaty with confusion, as the terror of confusion made me hot from within. Oh, I would just lay on the bed and be dead in ten minutes. Don't call the cops until you're certain I'm dead, and don't touch anything else. She said as she moved to the bed to lay on it, with the most stiff expression and resignation I had ever seen her wear. There I was as she spoke and left me, stunned. I watched in dread as my mother surrendered to death, and it crippled me to think that she knew. It was ten minutes, and just like that, just like she said, when the breeze had not blown and the world stood still around me, she knew, and it would haunt me forever.